Good day. Hey, Matthew. Uh, I actually have a webcam. Is the uh, is the norm to have a video for most attendees? I see a number of people tend to turn that on. Oh, especially if you're checking in, um, and you know, if I'm facilitating the meeting, I definitely uh, try to prioritize unless I'm in a situation where um, you know that's not practical. Okay. Am I coming through video and audio wise uh, clear? Yep. Yeah, great. Okay, I put together um, some pieces from the agenda. There was already a presentation uh, put into right. there by someone else. So my plan was just to stick to the uh, format that's in place, uh, quick attendance, stand up, and then presentation. So if anyone needs to duck out early, they at least get to see the presentation. And then right. the check-ins, and then issues, PRs, and then opening of the floor, whatever else follows. And that's about it, if that sounds about right. Yeah, uh, I made a note on the notes um, that check-ins actually, you know, it started first. So check-ins started first uh, as a, a workflow. Um, the uh, kind of attendance and stand-up um, has really taken most of the check-in, um, you know, workflows unless there's a major check-in and then we'll kind of, uh, slot something in later. Um, so, uh, like I'm, my only hesitation is, uh, you know, should check-ins and any, um, you know, quick sort of notifications around, uh, issues and PRs get pushed up into that first, uh, like, hey, like this needs to, you know, attention, uh, um, you know, before we go into something like a presentation, but you know, it's a, it's a minor detail. Otherwise, it looks great. Okay, I'll I'll put like an extra note there. I guess critical check-ins or something like that, or maybe just check-ins, and then the one I already have in column in uh, row four would just be additional or one-off check-ins. I guess the right. way to go would be to have the presentations and the check-ins, let all the people that maybe only have a 30 minute window get what they need done. And then they can right. duck out if they don't want to stay for all the PR discussions. That's right. That's right. Um, so, you know, one thing for today is, you know, since we do have a presentation and we want to get into a discussion, um, you know, if you don't have a, a um, you know, something really important or pressing, like, it's it's better to you know keep it short today, and then um, you know something that we haven't really uh, documented, uh, but is uh, our our standard practice. Uh, our, uh, you know, actually, it's it's only been like a uh, a couple months now. Uh, is uh, um, you know when you don't uh, when you when you uh, sign in, um, you put uh, you know no uh, no update beside your name if you don't want to get called on. Uh, you know, and, and when you're facilitating, you basically read through, um, you know, the list of folks, uh, you know, with anybody who, who doesn't have no update. Thank you. Actually, I'll go put okay. that in there now. See. Right on. Awesome. <laughs> what I'll do is I even and, added just yeah. some subheadings here so we can just have a hot link for the attendance thing I'll throw in the chat. Cool. Uh, we'll let, let the folks log in and then, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of in, uh, introduce you and uh, uh, let everyone know that you're uh, first time and you know, to provide feedback. Um, I guess commenting in the doc, probably best to keep it centered around the document that we're working on. Okay. Or you know, do you have any other preferences or uh, are you, did you set up a PR where folks can I added a couple, I closed one of them off, but I did add a few uh, PRs relating to documentation. One is on the um, scribe role. Uh, the other was like sort of a Perfect. jump start guide for a quick start guide for facilitators, but the notes I got from uh, Brandon and a couple others from the last meeting showed that, yeah, that'd be overkill. And then I believe I have, um, let me just see the backlog here. Uh, and then a, a minor one on updates to the meeting agenda, like the column based one, just so it isn't two sets of notes back to back. Uh, if right. uh, that's not the preferred way, I'll remove it. I just thought it maybe warranted a single trial and 
if it's hideous or untenable, then I'll just manually revert it to the existing format. Yeah, I I, I, uh, I think it's great to um, to be able to also see you know what someone else is capturing, and if you need to add to that, um, you know, we'll see if uh, um, you know editing in the small table uh you know is more challenging yeah the size was concern. Concern. Right. but i thought right. that if right. it was at least worth one shot of having them side by side so they sort of are cohesive instead of sort of two testimonies one after the other right on. we'll see how that turns out all right so we probably ought to get started uh we are um you know approaching a quorum number of folks um so uh, welcome everybody. We have a presentation today. Uh, I just dropped a link to our meeting notes. Um, uh, you know, we, we wanted to you know, dive into the presentation and you know, leave ourselves time for discussion. Um, so you know, let, let, let's prioritize you know, getting through uh, you know, stand up uh, relatively quick, quickly. So um, if you're new, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to have you introduce yourself. Um, and uh, today we have a new facilitator, uh, Matthew uh, Jasna is uh, going to be facilitating today. Um, and Matthew, this is uh, Matthew's first time, and uh, you know brings uh, you know some some experience uh, uh, and you know is uh, trial ballooning some stuff. Uh, so I'm going to shut up and uh, hand things over to, to Matthew. Uh, any sort of uh, feedback that you have uh, would be great to either capture your thoughts in um, in the document, in the meeting notes, or, um, you know, a, a, an issue on uh, our, our GitHub. Thank you, Matthew, all yours. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through the regular uh, workflow that we have for this. So attendance, stand up, uh, there's the link there in the chat. So anyone that's attending, please uh, feel free to add your name there. And if there's no updates or comments, or you don't wanna be called upon, uh, just please throw no update and parentheses beside your name and we won't ping you. Uh, feel free to leave it uh, without that if you're, say, new to here and you just want to get a quick spiel in. Uh, besides that, I thought we can just move into the presentation that we have today. So cartography using graphs to improve and scale security decision making. And the link there is on the slide. I just have to see. And uh, who's our guest presenting that today? That would be me. Today, Alex. Matthew, Thank before you. you get too far in, um, you know, make sure you get uh, scribes signed up here. We've got Ash. Sorry. Um, so okay. we, sorry, we have Ash Nagar, if I got that right, uh, as one of the scribes. And do we have anyone else for a second volunteer for meeting minutes as a scribe? Okay, we have uh, Ash, and if uh, someone else can just post in the chat, or if not, I'll uh, fulfill the role myself today. Um, thank you, Alex. Cool. So uh, dive right in. Please. Thank you. All right. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen then. Stop one. All right. Everyone able to see my screen? Coming through clear, lift cartography. Cool. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alex Kintavi. I am a software engineer at Lyft, and uh, I am the maintainer on a project called Cartography. Cartography is a tool that is a Python tool that pulls in assets, infrastructure assets from many different data sources, and it puts it all into a Neo4j graph database. And what we found is that having things in a graph database is very helpful in correlating multiple sources and it's also helped us answer some very complex questions. Cartography is open source. We open sourced it about almost a year ago. It might be coming up on its birthday. So happy birthday to Cartography and uh, what better way to celebrate its birthday than sharing it with SIG Security. So thank you all very much for having me here um, at this time. We're not necessarily looking to join the foundation. However, we are here for feedback and uh, for eventual submission. And our hope is that you all will find this as useful as we have found it so far. And so some of the motivations going into the project, 
uh, the bottom line is that we found that the cloud is really complicated and there are all kinds of different assets, all kinds of different permissions relationships and not understanding this and getting this stuff wrong can have some pretty bad consequences. And a lot of us on the project who um, have worked in cartography, we all come, a lot of us come from in a sort of offensive security background where we worked as red teamers. And what we found is that looking at things from a graph point of view has been very helpful in having us identify our targets, perform lateral movements. And we think that others can also find this useful as well. So if you are a blue team or if you are a service owner, if you any number of different roles on a security team, infrastructure team, what have you, I think that looking at this can be pretty uh, useful. So the things that uh, we, we, I took a look at some of the CNCF SIG security use cases. And I think that we've probably fit into some of a couple of these. As a security administrator, I can audit all accesses. I can understand my policy grants. As an enterprise operator, code operator, end user, I need a centralized way to look at all of these resources. As a developer, I can perform an access check. As an implementer, I can perform auditing of resource access. And although we didn't necessarily build it with these scenarios specifically in mind, like I said before, it came from a pen testing perspective. I think that uh, there's lots of ways where it fits into that. I want to, uh, so if at, at any point in time, something doesn't sound uh, like make a lot of sense, or if I'm being confusing, please interrupt me. I want to make this interactive. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions at all. And so um, I'm just going to dive right into kind of some of the use cases that we have. So with this first set of use cases, understanding access checks, understanding auditing, and looking at organizational resources in one way. Well, I'll show you how we do that at Lyft as a kind of a motivating example. So at Lyft, we use uh, Okta. Okta is a single sign-on provider. You authenticate with Okta, and then it delegates your access to all sorts of other different providers and resources, AWS being one of them. And the way that Okta works is that you'll have uh, an organization, a group, a user, and then you have a human identity. So I myself can have an Okta identity that can be a member of a group. And this is sort of kind of modeling what, the, what this would all look like in a graph. And what, um, okay, cool. Sorry, just uh, checking stuff. All right, yeah, so, and then, so one, the one thing I wanna highlight here is that if we wanted to keep an inventory of all of our Okta groups and all the Okta users, then if we had it in terms of a relational database, every single one of these edges would be a join. And joins, you know, they can work, but then quickly, if you want to correlate it with other things, the problem of keeping track of all of this in a relational database gets pretty complicated. So as I mentioned before, we use Okta to delegate access to AWS. It's a fairly, as far as I understand, it's a fairly common workflow where an Okta group will be allowed to assume an AWS role to become an AWS identity. And that AWS identity belongs to an account. And we can layer this together with other things too. So we can layer a, an HR organization, an HR structure. So we can go from the identity of myself, put in other HR data from a provider such as Workday at Lyft internally, we use something else, but Workday is uh, just as an example over here, we can layer it in there. And then here we have all sorts of different sources that are put together in this graph view and put that, you can augment this further and then add things like uh, I myself, I have a G Suite identity and this G Suite identity can let me connect things like a Duo CR Excavator, which is a tool that identifies risky Chrome extensions that are installed throughout your organization. And so putting all of these things together kind of leads me to my first uh, live demo. So let's pray to the demo gods. All right. So I kind of want to show you just what this looks like live. This is a a local database instance that I got running on my own laptop. And 
this is a visualization layer on top of the standard graph database. So it just looks a little prettier. So I have here user one, two, three. User one, two, three is a human. And then user one, two, three has an Okta user identity. And then this Okta user identity, I actually wasn't supposed to move that node. So I kind of messed up my demo already, but you can see that uh, if I expand this right here, this user one, two, three is a member of a number of Okta groups, including this AWS admins group. If I expand this AWS admins group, it tells me, oh man, you got so many other different things you can go to. Well, I'm just gonna, I'm only interested in this AWS role. So I'll let that expand. And then I, this AWS role, so let's expand this role. I get to another role. And then I'm gonna back up and explain this whole path, what I'm going on in just a little bit once I get everything kind of expanded here. So the idea here is that I have a user, I have a human that happens to have a Okta user identity. This Okta user identity is able to, it, it is a member of this Okta group. And because it's a member of this Okta group, it is allowed to assume this AWS role to become this AWS identity and AWS has this feature that lets you, if you are a certain role, you can assume other roles. So that's what this STS assume role allow relationship is. So if I am this role, I can assume this role. And sort of the reasoning for a cloud provider providing this functionality is for flexibility in your organization. And it, uh, if you come from an on-prem, I guess, uh, background, then this can be, uh, well, if you come from like an on-prem hacking background, then you should, your ears should be perking up right now because this is very interesting. This is literally lateral movement. If you have uh, the ability to be this role, then you can assume this. And then what other things can we do? What's interesting about this role? Well, let's see if I double click this. The thing that I want to highlight here, well, let's look at this. So this role, the 603 role, is a member of account DEF. AWS separates assets into different accounts. An account, if you're familiar with Azure, for example, is a, like an Azure subscription. It is a billable unit. And people, organizations, they um, delegate accesses and uh, organize a lot of their assets into different AWS accounts. So you can have a billing account, you can have like your service account, you can have all sorts of other things. And the main thing that I want to highlight in this demo is that, all right, our user can assume this role that lives in account ABC. Because we are this role, this role has a assume role allow relationship with this 603 role that lives in the DEF account. And so basically the TLDR of this is showing that you can, this highlights the ability to perform actions on another role that lives in another account. And is this a bad thing? Not necessarily. Like I said, you know, organizations can set things up like this because they know that they want this, that they want this kind of behavior. However, it, to get to this kind of information, it's very difficult and uh, you can't see it very easily if you were to look at it through the AWS console or to pull it up yourself. But through this sort of exploration flow with cartography, you can pull this up and then uh, we like to highlight these kinds of um, relationships. And this is kind of the problem space that we are very interested in being able to move between different permissions relationships, making sure that we have all of our assumptions on isolation uh, very well understood, especially when they cross different boundaries between services. Like this isn't all AWS. This is like going from Okta to AWS. And there's many other different pivot paths that we are interested in. We have a raised hand in the questions if you want. Uh, oh, thank uh, you. Name, uh, yeah, good. Uh, by all means. Hey. 
I was just curious about the the role names here because like mostly they in like they would normally in AWS have like a human readable name and they look at as look as though they're all like random numbers. Is that something that's introduced as part of the import or is that the actual role name? Oh, this is all dummy data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. So I just made it random numbers for the purpose of example. Um, I see some other questions in the group chat. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I was just going to power through them back to back. The next one was Prene. Uh, can we set any rules alerts over these graphs if some or some relations should not be allowed? We do have a feature that um, performs exactly that function. And um, it's admittedly not as full feature as it could be, but it does exist. I'll talk to that um, in just a, you know, a few slides later on. And I'll just add one of my own on top of that, and that was uh, this appears to be uh, rendering the data. I'm wondering if it uses certain APIs where you could go in and say, disable or decommission, say a role or an account. So like if say an account was compromised, does this allow you to directly jump in and say, decide what uh, resource should I disable to limit the damage to the running deployments? Or mm. is it more for logging and auditing as opposed to actively stepping in? In terms of, so the tool isn't focused on real time at the moment. It's not very good at that. Uh, so I guess right now the, we, we are definitely looking at real time um, because uh, to run a full sync, admittedly, it takes a decent amount of time to pull in all of these nodes, process them, load them to the graph. We're looking at other ways to deliver more, I guess, real time scenarios, such as by listening in on a cloud trail log, for example, other things like that. Um, but so we focus on visibility. Um, you can't, for example, like click on one of these things and be like, boom, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn that off. You know, we don't okay. have that capability right now. No, but it will give you that. What we found is that it gives us uh, that visibility um, to go to another console and then take that action. Okay. And we had uh, two more questions in the, the chat. I'll, I'll defer to you rather than uh, reciting them rote. Okay. Let's see. Is there any functionality for viewing changes over time for the sake of auditing changes to environment? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about that in just a little bit uh, viewing changes over time. Uh, you mentioned not using a SQL data store. Are you, what are you using as the backend data store? How are you at a high level storing data and performing correlations? So we don't use SQL. This uh, database is Neo4j and it, yeah, high level storing the data, performing the correlations. We have, um, we have a schema, so the, kind of the view on how we are making these relationships, representing them, that's kind of what I was showing there with like the diagrams, uh, or the way that we're doing our data modeling. Yeah, it's Neo4j UX, is the built-in UI. Yeah, so this is, this view I have right here, this is actually Lingcurious, which I don't wanna to distract too much from, I guess the actual topic, but, it is a visualization layer on top of Neo4j that just makes it nicer for presentations. I can show you guys this in vanilla Neo4j, but if I were to expand too many of these nodes, it would frankly blow up my browser. So um, we're just gonna go through things like in this way. Um, any other questions? Okay, yeah, feel free to interrupt me whenever. And so, so if we were to take a look at all of this, we can zoom out even more. And so this is the reason why I didn't want to use the vanilla Neo4j UI to show you, show all of you this, is that if we wanted to visualize all of these, all of the possible cross IM role assumption opportunities for all of the accounts in our fake organization, you know, this, this looks kind of amazing, looks kind of cool, but, um, the point here is to just to kind of show you that the cloud is complicated, even for a medium to large, for even for a medium sized organization, this is nothing really out of the ordinary, honestly. And being able to visualize all these things. Yeah, this is intimidating. However, there are ways that we provide to consume this data and make it a lot more tractable because uh, this is not this is very impressive to look at, but, Let's face it, this isn't really actionable. I'll show you um, just what I mean by that in a little bit. And the next thing that I wanna show you is, we also wanna talk, I also wanna talk to a couple of other different 
scenario. So another scenario that we looked at that fit in with the SIG security use cases was I need, as a network operator, I need a central way to look at the networks in my organization. I need to understand the effect of changes to network policy. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you right now in this quick cross-account connectivity demo. And all right, so uh, just a little bit of disclaimer, the, uh, these examples are pretty AWS heavy, mostly because Lyft is a very AWS heavy shop. It is kind of our area of familiarity. Um, however, I don't want to um, say that this is our only focus, that we're not uh, going to welcome other clouds. Um, yeah, we're definitely open the whole project for exploring many different clouds. We, um, yeah. So in this particular example, though, I've got an AWS account, and it has a virtual private cloud, a VPC if you're more familiar with Azure. I guess the closest analogy to that would be a virtual network. And what a VPC does is it has a number of different subnets that you can set up. So this is the 10.0 slash 16. And one thing that's neat with VPCs is that you can take these subnets and peer them with other subnets. And what that means is that because, so these pink relationships that I have here in this diagram, these are VPC peering relationships. What that means is if I have a host connected to this subnet, it is able to talk to a host in this subnet. And what I wanna highlight here is that these subnets belong to VPCs that belong in different accounts. So you should see that this is kind of a theme of my presentation. I love looking at things that uh, go across different account boundaries. And a thing that I wanna highlight here is I have this name account for service ABC. So service ABC, it's got this VPC, it's got this subnet, is peered with this 192.168 slash 24, lives in this VPC that lives in this account that I don't even know what the name is. What's going on here? We have no idea what this AWS account is. Well, I'll explain why this, why this happens. So what cartography does is that we'll enumerate all the accounts, we'll enumerate all the network assets. We will get the VPC data, we'll get the subnet data, and then when we enumerate the VPC data, we'll enumerate the, all the peerings that are available. And what happens here is that by calling that, we'll get back some JSON blobs that'll tell us, hey, you know, we know about this other CIDR block, we know about this other VPC, and it happens to live in an account that you don't control. And because you don't control it, we can't get the name of it, but here's its, uh, uh, it will give you back IDs. So I'll repeat that one more time. So this has, uh, this, in this particular organization's case, it is possible to discover cases where your account is peered with assets that belong to an account that you don't control. <laughs> And there are ways later on that we can further this analysis and build things to draw relationships to make this exploration even easier. A uh, quick question from my answer. Is there either a set of best practices or predefined rules, kind of like a, almost a linter, but for this software stack that uh, points out obvious uh, known bad use cases, such as what you described there, there's an account in your setup that you don't control or other corner cases, are there already established rules or examples for that, that you can just say, run this report or run this test and tell us what's wrong? Um, this is an area of, I guess, active research. Uh, the the Neo4j Cypher query language, it's, uh, it's basically like SQL, but it lets you draw out these sorts of relationships so you can quickly identify these paths. I'll show an example of that, what that, uh, query language looks like, but the idea is that you would draw out a relationship from here to here to here all to visualize this whole path. And then whenever that path matches on something, when that query matches on something, you can fire an alert or take an action. Um, again, I'll get into that just a little bit. It's not specifically tailored for our scenarios, but we have the ability, I'll show this in a little bit also, we have the ability to make what we call analysis jobs. So uh, in an analysis job, we would identify paths that look like this and we could draw a shortcut relationship. 
between these two accounts to show, hey, you know, uh, this is something you might want to look at and so that you don't have to look at it this way and have it be that cumbersome. Thank you. There's one more question from Elvin in the chat. Are you or would you consider leveraging high cardinality data like VPC flow logs? That goes into, we're, we'll definitely be welcome to exploring that. That goes into kind of what I was talking about earlier on consuming new sources of real-time data such as cloud trail logs. It's not a design goal, at least in the next three months. In the next six months, we have on our roadmap to start exploring at least cloud trail, but VPC flow logs uh, that we can definitely like put that in that same family of real-time data sources. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, so then, so that's a very pretty good segue about uh, going on to doing some analysis. So you mentioned about, oh, you know, how do you make these shortcuts? And let's kind of pivot ourselves a little bit here because we want to ask ourselves, all right, I have a bunch of compute instances. How do I know if they are open to the internet or not? Uh, and this is a complicated question to answer because there's all sorts of different security group rules and uh, things that you need to compute to figure out what's going on. And this is kind of the data model for that. We've got our instance, it's got a network interface, member of a security group, which has a number of different firewall rules and it's got, uh, it, which is connected to a number of different IP ranges. How do we do that? How do we identify, how do we tell if this EC2 instance is connected to the internet or not? Well, we do something like in the f uh, analysis job. So what we do is that we do something like match on an IP range. So match on the internet, the zero slash zero network, look for all of the IP rules that come from the internet what are the security group rules that roll up to that IP rule? Are they connected to any EC2 instances via their network interfaces? So we're drawing out this path. And if so, if there are any EC2 instances that satisfy this criteria, set, them, set this flag, exposed internet equals true. So what that does is rather than run this massive query every single time need to memorize that, I can simply ask myself, let's go look at all of the EC2 instances that have this exposed internet true flag. And we apply this uh, similar set of logic for Google Cloud instances also. So we have, uh, this is an example analysis job and we have similar things in GCP. And similar rules, you can do the same thing for an elastic load balancer, for example. And so I'll show that uh, just real quickly, what that looks like in demo land. I have a question here. Isn't this missing network ACLs for reachability? I can have a public IP without. Yeah, this is missing all sorts of different things for this demo. Um, I'm, I'm uh, glossing over all kinds of details in the interest of time. Yeah, so sorry if this is like not entirely 100% correct, but this is, yeah, this, I'm just trying to blast through this. <laughs> uh, very, very good observations. Um, so this is only looking at it from the perspective of rules on the EC2 security group. So in this case, what we can look at is if we've got different accounts, let's say I have this uh, account for service ABC and I've got this special projects account. And this account has a number of different instances that we've identified as internet exposed. So this flag here is true. And so let's say that these are web facing rules. And from the previous demo, we know that uh, there's VPC peering that's possible. VPC has this subnet. Uh, the subnet happens to be peered to this other VPC that lives in this special projects account. And what that means is that if, let's say that this special projects account stores all of our top secret stuff so what that means here through the magic of this path, this web facing instance is able to talk to the special projects instance, even though the special projects instance is not directly connected to the internet. 
and it is an I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader to draw the relationship from this instance over to this instance as part of an analysis job. So again, this is kind of the set of problems and questions that we're interested in answering and kind of the, I guess, motivating scenarios for looking at our tool. And let's see, <clears throat> I'll just speak briefly on, uh, there are a lot of questions on how can you view changes over time. As an enterprise operator, I need to see what about the resources changed. I need to provide logs for changes to critical resources. And we accomplish, we accomplish this through something that we call drift detection. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the limitations of our tool, one of the very, um, it's, it's a pain point of ours that we've known for a while, is that we need to pull in all this data. That graph is huge. And it takes a while to process it. It takes a while to sync it all. And then so you take one time slice and you take another time slice. It's not very good at real time. But we can kind of get around that through something called drift detection. So in this particular case, let's say that we have a known set of storage buckets that we expect to be open to the internet. Every so then we can keep that. And then so we have we build ourselves a query asking ourselves, which are the S3 buckets that have anonymous access equals true. Every time this list deviates from our known set of expectations, we can fire an alert. And in this case, this is demonstrating a Slack alert. So we have a couple of different reporters available right now in, um, in GitHub. We've got a Slack reporter, we have a Jira ticket reporter, and then you know it's uh, modular enough that you can build your own reporter on top of that. So you can find out which of your assets deviate from a known set of expectations every time a graph sync is run. And I, it's left up to the implementer how often you want this sync to run. We're far from the, open, the only open source security graph in town. What really sets us apart? And there's a few things. Uh, first, uh, I wanna say that uh, you know, we are extensible. As I showed earlier, we got Intel modules from different sources. We got GCP, we got AWS, Okta. We have, we could, you can extend these queries with analysis jobs. And uh, like I said, multiple data sources. We are also not deployment opinionated. We don't care about whether you run a Docker container or run vanilla in compute instances. Like I say right here, it's very subjective, but I think that our community, the aspects there, I think we got a pretty great growing fledgling community and we hope that uh, you will join in as well. And so kind of moving into this aspect, I think that this is one of the strongest aspects of cartography. We have been very thankful for the response that we've gotten from the community so far over the past year, maybe getting about a hundred clones every week or so. And, uh, one, I guess, key milestone is like on the Lyft loves open source page. Wow, you don't even got to scroll down for us anymore. So it was like, that was a, that was, I was immensely happy about that. Selected highlights for a brief moment. We were more interesting than Lyft's IPO. All right, great. Uh, top of Hacker News, that's lifetime achievement. Um, this was one of the first external contributors that we did not ask for. We got... Oh, this was one where I created an issue and then a uh, community member jumped in to come and help me out. Thank you, Zach. And this one was the first case where a community member reviewed the code of another community member. And we're, it's getting to a point where we have more people from the community working on this project than we do have Lyft employees working on the project. And I want to kind of foster that sense community like to kind of grow that a little bit uh, even more because this is useful to so many more places than just lyft and like i said in our community you can join us on our open source slack we have a monthly meeting uh, calendar link is there minutes are there video recordings of our meeting are there we have users from all kinds of different companies and uh, many more to come hopefully and you know, I want to end this presentation with uh, this call to action that we need your feedback. Um, please uh, look into the graph, play with it, say hi to us. And, you know, we're really focused on how can we make this more useful for you. And 
speaking a little bit to the roadmap in about one within like one month or so, we want to have runnable examples for new users so that you don't have to necessarily install Neo4j because depending on, because they can be a little tricky. Um, so having things runnable so you can play with uh, some of those exposure scenarios that I showed you um, just a, a little while ago, you can play with that without downloading and doing a lot of install work. We're looking at ingesting tags so that you can look at um, getting all sorts of attribution, resource attribution information, knowing about uh, who owns what on a service. And then in kind of three months, we're looking at more infrastructure improvements to our graph sync it itself. So uh, resilience via DAGs. So uh, if the AWS sync fails, then what will happen now is that everything else will fail after that. And that's just, um, it, it was uh, kind of a move that like uh, get it out the door, let everything run serially. But I mean, there's no reason because the GCP has no data dependency on AWS. So we should create something smarter than that. And as I mentioned in six plus months, we're looking at ingesting more real-time data. Uh, this last one, we got more shameless plugs here. Um, we're in the, uh, there's some blog posts on us. There's some conference talks that we've given. But um, yeah, again, you know, thank you very much for having me. And then um, I can open the floor for some more questions. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we've got at least, uh, we've got up to five minutes for additional Q&A. And if uh, there's anything further that requires more detail, I posted the Slack link there so we can reach out to Alex and his team. Oh, I see that there's some more that came up in the chat, actually, that I missed. Um, let's see. Are you guys using this in practice for SOC operations at Lyft? Yes, and I didn't talk to it in this presentation, but if you look at the RSA link, uh, when we show this off at RSA, I think um, my colleague, Sasha, he shows how we use it for incident response. How can you find out who owns a given service? Who do you loop in? How do you, who is the VP for that, et cetera, et cetera. Is Neo4j license ever been an issuer for potential users? Are there thoughts on pluggable graph DBs? I'm not the best person to ask about licensing or other graph databases. We gravitated toward Neo4j because we really like the cipher syntax. We found that it's very useful for being able to, you literally draw things out. And it's, uh, it reminds me of uh, Prologue, I guess. Anyway, we, we've, we really like that language. Oh, GPL, oh, okay. Did you explore building identities as abstract roles layered over nodes like AWS and Okta or is service specific chaining the key thing? Um, abstract roles, do you mean like, I guess- I can also, clarify, Alex. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you have a cloud operator and, you know, maybe you're multi-cloud uh, or, you know, building out contingency plans, um, you know, is, as, as you're looking at those roles, is it, um, uh, more important to just, you know, get the actual correlations of reality, or is there any uh, thoughts on, uh, you know, taking those and, and kind of abstracting that uh, so you could, you know, look at a AWS and a, you know, a GCP and Azure? I think I understand. Um, uh, stop me if I didn't quite get the question, but what cool. we do is that there are certain cases where we apply multiple labels to the same node. So a compute instance is a compute instance, whether it's in Azure land or in GCP. So we'll apply a GCP instance label to it, and we'll also apply a generic instance label to it as well. Right. And then so similar things for VPCs, like they live in AWS, they also live in um, other cloud providers. Right. So multiple. So you levels. have both. <laughs> Say again. So you have both. Yeah, exactly. The abstract role and the specific role. Huh? Right. Yes. Right. All right. Uh, it looks like we got all the questions on the backlog here. And again, if anyone wants to reach out to Alex for more, we've got the Slack link and the links he's provided there. So thank you very much for your presentation, Alex. Well, thank you. Okay, with that said, I'll uh, move on to the essentially working group and SIG uh, check-ins plus individual check-ins if anyone has anything to bring up. I think it will be 
a bit brief today. I think we just have one update so far. Uh, so I guess first the SIGs or working groups, do we have any reps from external SIGs or working groups that uh, need to do any check-ins or bring up any topics? Just gonna go through the list to see if anyone's listed themselves as such. I don't see anyone as noting themselves representing a SIG, uh, at least with an update here. Yeah, I'm not saying any of the usual suspects, uh, you know, policy folks uh, or Mark Underwood on okay. today. So. I'll get to know the names. All right, well, if I've you missed know. anyone, uh, feel free to chime in. Then in that case, I'll just go to the individual updates. We have one from Cameron Cedar, if I got the name right. Good day, Cameron. Yes, I am here. How is everyone? Good, good. Yourself? Good. Doing well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I put in a suggestion there. Um, suggestion was to uh, to create a an end user uh, slide deck around security. I don't know if you were able to take a look at the issue, but just just to outline who SIG security is in the CNCF, and also to dig deeper on um, considerations. Uh, to end users around security and uh, things that, that they might consider uh, for security in the public cloud, for security around Kubernetes, uh, whatever cloud native platform that they might be using for their, um, for their organization or for their application delivery. Um, and so it's just a way to uh, uh, get the word out. It's a way to express some of the considerations from uh, the SIG security group and uh, um, to have a general understanding of what it is that we're, we're trying to accomplish. <clears throat> so any thoughts or ideas around that? I'm trying to work up, you know, kind of a, a draft uh, doc at the moment to show everybody what that might look like and then uh, and kind of go from there. Um, so, a, a couple. Oh. What are you for saying? Um, so a couple of things that you uh, potentially pull in, um, you know, with changes to uh, KubeCon, uh, you know, the pressure is kind of, uh, you know, uh, gone off and, and uh, uh, finalizing everything, but we do have um, you know, intro and deep dive uh, slide decks that are underway for uh, for that. I don't see Brandon on to sort of get an update on um, you know where those stand. So there's some prior art to pull in. Uh, you know, love the initiative. Then the other uh, you know point that I wanted to touch on in terms of uh, validating um, you know get, getting early feedback and validation of uh, you know, the content and it, its uh, viability, uh, there is a new end user working group uh, called Contributor Awareness, uh, I'm probably butchering that, um, that uh, is, is focused on uh, a bit more on, you know, contributors uh, and, uh, you know, that might be a good forum to uh, to go and uh, present, uh, you know, the document, get feedback and, uh, uh, ensure that, that um, we've captured enough to, you know, get some from, from outside of our, you know, little group uh, okay. to, to share. Okay. Good points, good points. The only thing I was going to add on top of that was, is that was actually just by pure fluke, one of the suggestions that I put into the notes for today. And uh, my take on that was if, uh, it was possible to take either that or a subset of it and put it pretty much between the background and vision sections of the SIG security main page. Sort of a, for new members, how do I get started uh, chopping wood and carrying water sort of thing? Where do we start best? Yeah. Hey guys, this is uh, Vinay here. Um, I actually have a, a very generic uh, reference architecture kind of uh, a posture for this particular topic. and. and would happy to contribute that if that would uh, help with the uh, material. Sure. Would it be something that could be attached to the uh, like the existing ticket for reference right now? Let me see. That's uh, let's see, number three six two. 
Uh, let me take a look at it, but I'm, I'm sure it can. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I, 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 I'll take a closer look and then, because uh, yeah, it's very generic and uh, and it, it takes it gives a it takes a posture on how you know comprehensive security for CI/CD and I and I noticed that that was one of the so so how does that look like and where security can be inserted uh, as as appropriate and so on. Thank you. Awesome. I'd love to look at it. Sure. We'll, uh, we'll, maybe we can chat through the, through the ticket, uh, through the issue. Okay. That said, it looks like we've covered the SIG and working group check-ins plus individual contributor check-ins. If anyone else wants to jump in or bring up anything on those topics, uh, please feel free. If not, there was uh, one other ticket here in the two other tickets here in the agenda and then the usual PRs requiring chair approval, non listed, and opening the floor. Okay, so I'll just jump into uh, one that I put together myself last week, a minor documentation update number 350. Uh, essentially just adding a scribe role to the existing roles within our documentation on the SIG security page. I don't imagine there'll be too much to that, maybe a paragraph or two in bullet form. So if uh, there's no concerns about it, I'm happy to just go in, create the pull request, uh, run the draft by the team and implement any recommended edits and away we go. I don't imagine it will be uh, very much time on that one. Are there any comments on this one here? That's great. Um, it'd be probably worth uh, pinging Brandon, uh, who um, is, has done uh, a lot of uh, facilitation recently to get uh, his input uh, as well. Okay. Should I treat him as a critical reviewer for anything pertaining to the, the main GitHub page documentation, that sort of thing? Um, for the facilitator role, definitely. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we've gone through and, and doc, yeah, been, been looking to document most of our, our roles. Uh, the facilitator role is you know, something we introduced uh, in the last year or so. Uh, you know, it's actually mentioned in the roles, but not documented. Uh, so really appreciate, uh, you know, the work Matthew to, to get that documented and uh, get some clarity so we can help uh, more folks on board and uh, top wood, carry water, participate. Thank you. All right. I'll make sure to include that for the facilitator plus scribe, uh, tentative scribe role. Okay. Let's see. I think there was one left here on the backlog. Here. Uh, suggestion to find a review process for CNCF projects being considered for graduation number 367. I'm just going to open yeah. that here. Uh, hi, this is Ash. Uh, so we spoke about this last week about formalizing a process for projects looking to graduate. Uh, and so I just created an issue from last week's meeting. Uh, I, I put some thoughts in this issue 367. So if you guys have any feedback on this, uh, that would be really appreciated. So yeah, take a look um, and we can chat on the comment on the, the issue. The, the TOC issue for the graduation process, I believe got merged yesterday that Michelle was working on in the TOC, CNCF TOC repo. So it might just be worth cross cross referencing what we want to do with what the TOC has required that we do. Do do we have that issue up somewhere? It's on. Um, I just have to find it. It's uh, okay. Um, I believe it's issue three six one. No, that's. Or, uh, no, that's the, the sandbox, sandbox one. There, okay. there was a graduation one that got merged yesterday. Uh, um, three seven PR three seven four. Okay, I, I can link to that as well. Uh, I, I'll look for that. Okay. Three seven. We had some discussion um, amongst the tech leads and the chairs regarding that. Whatever. Um, process that we work on should be pretty lightweight for right now until we have a, a few more assessments under our belt because we're still working through that process and I don't want anybody to be forced to comply with the process that's not actually going to work because we've not quite gotten to that point of evaluation for graduation projects 
So whatever the recommendation is or if someone is planning on drafting a PR, I think we should start lightweight first um, based off of the lessons learned from our previous assessments. Yeah, I think that's um, that makes sense, and especially as I think the the wording on the PR that we got yesterday was that the graduation process should be relatively lightweight because most of the issues should have been addressed at incubation, and if they were so, if they were specific outstanding ones, those would be addressed at graduation. But in general, it should graduation should be relatively lightweight. All right, thank you. So there do not appear to be any PRs requiring chair approvals. So we can wrap things up with just general discussion slash opening up the floor. Um, if anyone wants to grab the mic, now's the time. All right, so I guess uh, 15 seconds. Uh, Long silence, and I'll treat that as we're all good to go. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for facilitating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Matthew. Cheers. Okay, everyone.